In 1976, a 14-year-old motherless child responded to a flyer that had been posted on his school's bulletin board, which simply, <laughs> which simply said, drummer seeks musicians for band. The three teenagers who turned up for the audition with the drummer became one of the greatest music acts in history. In the last 40 years, they've sold 150 million albums. They've won 22 Grammys, and they've played live in front of 26 million people. has gone on to use his rock star platform as a political activist against AIDS and extreme poverty. He's persuaded presidents, prime ministers, billionaires and kings to change the way that they view the world. And he's been a key figure in tens of billions of dollars of new money being channeled into the global fight for justice and equality. And now, finally, he has added a new and extraordinary string to the guitar that even he admits he doesn't play very well. <laughs> He's written a 200,000 word memoir that challenges what can be done within the genre of autobiography. It mixes stories, self-analysis, art and music and it speaks with honesty and poetry and wit about his life as an artist, an activist, an actualist and an alleyist, as it all makes sense later on. He's the man who played for Mandela, who sang at Obama's inauguration, at the Super Bowl, at Live Aid and at Live Eight. He's performed at the White House in Sarajevo and inside a bomb shelter in Ukraine. But tonight, he's here. Cheltenham, please welcome the brilliant... Stars have been gate crashing literary festivals, and I know I'm just the latest in a long line. But tonight, I want to salute a writer who can gate crash any rock and roll show he wants. I know this is a literary festival, but please feel free to put your fists in the air. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I've written a book. Thank you. Um, um, I've written a book, um, but it turns out the most extraordinary thing about me are the people I am in re relationship with. Um, I met most of them the same week. Um, which is, I suppose, extraordinary. I began life with my wife, Ali. The same week I joined you two. Uh, one week during high school, and my whole life, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, when Ali and I uh, married, we, we moved out of our family homes, that's how young we were. Um, we moved into an old stone tower on the Irish coast and now spare us the furrowed brow of earnest young men reading and writing poetry. I had read W.B. Yeats's The Tower and then we moved into one. Um, please indulge my reading of it if you would. The walls of the Martello Tower were made of granite and seven feet thick. There's a fort containing there's a fort 
containing three circular rooms, two bathrooms, and a kitchen built into the walls. The living room is like a granite igloo with an opening onto a solid stone winding staircase leading up to the lockout that we slept in. We built a glass room where we could look over the promenade of the seaside town of Bray. We were living in the lighthouse. I, I know. <laughs> I discovered Ali will let her soul be searched, but only if you arrive at her fort defenseless have you half a chance at challenging her own almost unbroachable defense system. It's the only way over that drawbridge. The poet was not up to the poem. It wasn't two years into our marriage and I could see my young wife in prolonged moments returning to the vast silence she holds inside herself. She was suggesting that even when I was home, I wasn't home. Our weekly walks along the promenade could be tinged with melancholy. There is anyway a kind of off-color romance to a deserted seaside town in the winter. Your hearts offer a score on the sound of the tide crashing over a stony beach, shushing everything as the waves try to make up their mind, whether they're leaving or staying, leaving or staying leaving us then. White waves kissing black stone, shushing all around me.
Something going on there. Thank you. Um, it's more than a thrill to be in Cheltenham this evening and feel so welcome. Isn't this the birthplace of Brian Jones? I could not imagine my life without the Rolling Stones, just saying that straight off. Anyway, it feels like such a treat to be in the English countryside. And I remember Ali and I on the train hurtling through um, these landscapes on our first visit to the big smoke. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was... Um, it was a trip because she was going to try and help me score a record deal for you too um, when our manager didn't think that that was likely or possible and I was 18 going on 12 Ali was 17 going on 17 and we managed to talk her family into this idea without explaining that we'd know where to stay. You see, God was our travel agent. But God had apparently not got the memo. And so we ended up sleeping on a bench in Paddington uh, railway station. And um, we'd taken the ferry across the sticks from Dublin to Hollyhead. Um, yeah, our manager was right. <laughs> but we weren't wrong either. So let me... I wrote it all down, of course. The train lays down a rhythm track. It keeps its own time, slowing and speeding until the Welsh accented towns and valleys give way to the cheers and jeers of the English countryside, which eventually engorges us and we descend into the underworld of love. Here in the tile tunnels, the drumbeat crescendos in volume until we are spat out onto a station platform in Paddington. London, where we made our way to the circus. That was Piccadilly. This is it. Orpheus in the underworld with a cassette player instead of a lot. Orpheus and his lover, Eurydice. But it's not the beguiling Eurydice who will need saving. It's Orpheus himself. She's here to save his life because she knows if he doesn't become who he is here, he will never have one. This is the story of how Eurydice saved Orpheus from his own hell. The story of how Alison Stewart saved me from myself.
Slido. Has anyone done Slido yet? Yeah. So Slido is easy. You go to there, to slido.com, and you put in the code there, LE19, and then you can put any question that you like into it. 
and I will get the trick questions and I'll choose just a few of them to read out to him and there might just be a little, there might be a little something for people whose questions get chosen. I'm only saying that to stop you writing rude things. Um, Bono. Yes. It's, Emma. To be entirely frank, right at the top, it's a fucking long book. <laughs> Short rock star, tall tales. I mean, it's 560 pages, and I actually read every single one of them. I haven't, I haven't. Children have been, I have a job. It just took forever. It's, well, we can talk. to me with your ADT problem. <laughs> we can talk later about what I thought about it. What do you think about it now it's done? I'm very glad it's over. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's changed me. I don't know if it's changed me for the better. Um, it's still, you know, I've just realized in the last couple of days, really, I've been, that I've written a book about a word that I don't truly comprehend and can't fathom. And so, yeah, it's the end of the book is the beginning of um, a great adventure for me, which is trying to figure out what the title meant. It's it's a perfect title. I I I think it's you come back to it again and again and again in the book, and you come back to it in all three of the voices that you write in. So I feel you write you write as a writer, you write as an activist. And you write as a pilgrim. A Pilgrim's lack of progress would have been a good title. <laughs> but it's, it, it feels like a man in search of himself. Is that, was that the plan? Is that how it came out? Was it, was it one of those books that you'd written it already in your head before you put a single word on paper? Or did you discover it as you were going through? I mean, all art is an attempt to identify yourself, I think. And, um, you know, we write it, we make it, for all the wrong reasons as well as the right ones. I started out, um, first of all, I, actually, I wanted to tell, some, tell the story um, of what I've been doing with my life to, I wanted to explain to myself, but I wanted to explain to my family and my friends and you two fans, and especially when it came to my family, I wanted to tell them what I'd been doing with their life because they, in so many ways, permissioned me to go out, you know, on the road and be an activist and be an artist. And I wanted them, I wanted a record for it because for some people it's, it's just a photograph or you're there, um, you know, shaking the hands of some dodgy geezer and but I wanted them to understand the organizations that had brought me there, the One Campaign, Red, Jubilee, that I wanted people to understand um, and, and that I, I saw them as sons, these organizations, and that I looked for the top line melody, that's who I am, uh, in, a, in an argument, in a room, you know, in anything that I do. And I wrote the book to sort of prove that that was the same person that you're you're not these different people, you're one person and you've one life as an artist. But by the end of the book, I kind of, I felt I'd won that argument and then I went off it. And I thought, oh, I really just want to write the greatest song I've never heard and be sung by it, if that's not a too pretentious description. Be sung by it in the same way that you talk about in the book when you sing songs, sometimes the songs end up singing you. Yeah, it sounds sort of clever and poetic or just cliché and dumb, but there is a thing, and any performer will tell you, there's, there's material that you have to carry, and then there's material that carries you. And as a singer, I have to step inside the songs, then I can hit those notes, and I can communicate. And um, and that's just that's just a, a great feel. It's like being a bell and being rung, 
and you, you, you know, everything makes sense at that point. And that is, I suppose, a very, you know, my drug of choice. Um, but it's not a drug, although it is an analgesic of some kind. It's, it's a very extraordinary thing to be in front of a U2 audience. And there was a, a great critic called Robert Hilburn who said he loved the Rolling Stones and he said, go to see the Rolling Stones no matter what you've been through that day. Um, you, know, you go and see the Rolling Stones, you just feel good about yourself. Go to see a U2 show, you feel really good about the person standing next to you. <laughs> So I don't know what that is. That's good. That's good. That's great. About wanting to explain to your kids where you've been. There's such a lovely line in it. I'll get it wrong, but it's but, it, but you were talking about how bad you felt about leaving Ali at home with the children for so long while you were out on the road, and you said Ali had to explain to my children that Daddy was away putting food on someone else's table. Well. Yeah, there's a few slightly squirmy moments when your children, when, when, a, when a, an airplane goes overhead and they go, my daddy works there. <laughs> and, uh, or yeah, no, he play, he works in stadiums. <laughs> and he's a footballer? No, there's only one side. Uh, and yeah, but the, the activism, the privilege of working with Lucy Matthew or working with your Husbands with Richard Curtis, with Bob Geldof, with these these are extraordinary people, and and I think it's very important that people understand that the values they were the values of you two. We formed around those values. We played our first anti-apartheid show before we had a record deal, and um, and they are families' values. They're Ali's values. So when she said that. She meant that. I want to go back. There's so much to discuss in this extraordinary book, but I want to go back to that time you referenced earlier when you were 14, the, the year that you began you two, the year that you met Ali and began going out with her, but also the year that your mother died. You were 14 years old and she died very suddenly of a brain aneurysm. And You've said in the book that until we deal with the biggest trauma, a part of us stays at that age. And it kept, that event with Iris, your mum, kept you at 14 for a very long time. Hello. <laughs> and you're still sort of there because it wasn't processed in your home, was it? It wasn't discussed and worked through and understood and grieved. Yeah, we sort of disappeared. And um, it's just a way my, my father couldn't deal with the grief. I mean, he he he, he didn't know where to, where to put it, and he was feeling all kinds of complicated feelings around it. So we just her name just didn't come up, and and so and I'm sure this is this must really hurt you as a mother as any mother, would, but. We did not speak about my mother, and I fear it was worse than that. We did not think about her. But uh, there was a moment in the book we we had a this is a really hard one to get your head around. But we found this little cottage, a yellow cottage, on the edge of the graveyard, where you two just after we finally could got our own nurse place and we were in this house and it was like you know um would be an electric heater larry be toasting his sandwiches and i'd be steaming them and edge who had the same sandwiches every single day <laughs> oh, every single day his mother gave him she, not that she they didn't you know they, she just forgot she gave him cheese yesterday and so we do that the toast and cheese sandwich and we were, we were working on a song and I was particularly unpleasant. And I had my brain rearranged by Johnny Lydon, Public Image Limited. And I was, wow, it's gone beyond three chords, Edge. It's just two chords now. You, you, can, you can write a song on two strings and it's like, oh really? Yeah? 
And I said, oh, oh, Eddie, yeah. And, and I, I, I grabbed his guitar. And he let me. And I put it around my neck. And I started going, yeah, 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 and I said, what, what? He goes, it's good, keep going. And uh, I'm like, okay, ding, 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 ding. And then I gave it back to him. I gave it back to Adam, and gave it back to Larry. And they made this incredible noise with it. And in this ego-filled and ego-less moment, this song called I Will Follow was formed you walk away, walk away, I will follow the rhythm. Walk away, walk away. Like a like a wow wow pedal. And we were building it. Walk away, walk away, I will follow, walk away, walk away. We had that bit. And then it ended. And they all looked at me and said, What's what's it about? <laughs> and I said, uh, I think it's I think it's like a suicide note. And I think it's a it's a boy who's just, he's gonna follow his mother into the grave. And none of us in that room mentioned the fact that our rehearsal room is on the wall of the graveyard where my mother Iris was buried a hundred yards. I'd never visited the grave. And we were writing this song so you think it's not there, but it's screaming. You're the thing that you deny. It's screaming inside you, and it's going to find its way out. And it's created a beautiful knockoff of Public Image Limited's <laughs> <laughs> Public Image Limited. And um, where would we be about Johnny Lydon? Do we? What an amazing gift he is to the world. Um, Anger is an energy. But these, I got through my life with those, these, this music, punk rock music, saved my life. And something to rage alongside you, wasn't it? There's a, you know, in that period when you lost your mum and you also, in a way, lost your dad, in the, your relationship with him was so complicated right through to the end. He was, he was he was the most held in of men and and you said that you began searching for other families and the first of those well the first was the gangs that you fought with on the streets of dublin wasn't it but the second gang the second family you found was you too and your descriptions of those boys are a love affair well not always <laughs> and you know there's a, there's a there's a lot of fighting in our family um but, yeah, alternative families, that's right. I mean, even Ali's family, I gotta move in <coughs> to them, you know, and he, you know, Terry becomes my father, sort of thing. Then there was the YouTube family. And my father, you know, was, what it is, is you've got three Irish males at home shouting at each other. And it's not really a home, it's just a house. And my dad is, he, he's, he loves opera, he's a great tenor. And he's listening to La Traviata, and he's conducting our stereo at home with knitting me. <laughs> he's lost in himself, and I now understand what he was lost in, and the grief he was trying to you know, undo, you know, uncork it. But he was, he was mischief, I, I hope in the book I've, I've got, a, the right portrait of me. He had mischief. So when he said to me, listen son, you are a baritone. Who thinks he's a tenor? <laughs> that was very accurate. But it was also kind of mischief. And, and he, he had difficulty. He had difficulty with his own dreams. He, he, and this sounds very Irish. I want to I be... Mean, not just Irish, but it's it's a thing of the period where for my father to dream is to be disappointed. So don't dream. So he he, he was very you know, he read, he 
loved Shakespeare, he could paint. He was really a very talented fellow, very clever. But in the Ireland of the 50s and 60s, there was, you know, there was nothing much going on. Um, so he didn't want us to be disappointed, I think, was part of it. But the, yeah, you know, these, I came to you 2 that became my family. And then there was Gavin and Googie, and they were on our street too. And, and they were, I mean, I'm the straight one. So the Virgin Prunes were formed. Um, Edge's brother, who was a card carrying genius, um, he, and, um, and he, he was the guitar player in the Virgin Prunes. And Gavin Friday from 141 used to wear, you know, he had the kind of Doc Martens on a skirt. And, and his hair in the uh, there's a movie called A Razorhead by David oh, yeah. Lynch. He looked like that. And his father was this, you know, world class Dublin man would come home and the Virgin Prunes would be getting ready for their show and Anne Hanvey, the mother, would be like doing them up in, you know, uh, plastic latex uh, <laughs> jumpsuits and the dad would come in and uh, Pascal was his name. And, and we'd be there, and we'd go, oh, Mr. Hanfey. He'd go, Mr.'s a name for a fool. <laughs> Call me Pascal. And uh, what's he doing in a dress? Answer me that. <laughs> He's becoming a virgin prune. Uh, but these were, yeah, they're, 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 these were, yeah, these were blood brothers. There was another family that came later, your activism family became your, your next family. But let's talk about you two for a moment. I, I haven't taken on board until I read your very, very brilliant but very, very long book that, um, that what you were trying to do with you two was kind of different. I think almost any other band in the world. I mean, the, 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 the mountains that you set in front of yourselves, the, the, the level to which you were never satisfied with how it was going, you were always reinventing yourself, you were always pushing yourselves. What, what were you looking for? Uh, world domination. <laughs> um, without a conscience. <laughs> no, we just, we never felt that we'd, that, that we never felt that we, could execute the songs we heard in our head. You know, we, 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 had, we had this extraordinary thing live with our audience. It was very hard for us to get down on record. And what you discover is that being crap is not the enemy of great. Very good is the enemy of great. And when you get very good, great actually starts getting suspicious of you. So it's a funny thing. It's like there's a, there's a bigger chasm between very good and great than I don't know what I'm doing and great. So we, in our band, we, we genuinely seem to do our best work when we, know, when we don't know what we're doing. And so that's why we kept changing the, the scenery, changing the furniture. You know, it was almost like we changed the band. You know, if you're a solo artist, you can just work with different musicians. But for us, you know, Edge you know, will play the bass, or Adam will play the guitar, or whatever. Um, but to get to that place where you are lost, and having to be, fa you know, having to, to find yourself um, that's why we got, to, that's why, that, that was a strategy as much as anything. Do you feel it's worked? Not it's doing too bad. <laughs> um, but some, sometimes those journeys may not look as obvious as you think. For example... I also like hearing you say that though, because you're, you're very self-deprecating all the way through the book. You're, you're, you're very rarely going, we did great. Yeah, but I've done the humble thing now. It's written, it's done. Um, <laughs> sitting beside you. I, I, tr I try to be as blunt 
as I could be in the book. And it's not a confessional, but it's more it's 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 more personal than that. It's it's anatomical. You know, I go into if people are interested in you know what it is to be an artist or a singer. There's very little psychology, for example, written on the on on being a, a performer, being on stage. There is now. Well, there's some of it now, some of it now, yeah. I mean, you've written it. Well, thank you, but I'm trying to because there's, I mean, there's stuff about actors, you know, actors, there's some scholarship and some good writing on actors, but being in the middle of a U2 show or whatever it is, and that feeling, the feelings that you pick up from a crowd or, or whatever else, and, the, and, and this strange thing that happens, which people don't believe, where the ego is both exploded you know, by being famous and successful and all that good stuff. But it also, there's an implosion that happens. And I can't quite explain it, I'm trying to, where you're, where you feel maybe not worthy to be where you are. And there was this kind of punk promise, going back to the Johnny Light and then going back to the Clash and the Remont, where we felt our audience had said, look, you don't worry about where your kids are going on holidays and you can, you're going to do well, but don't be fucking crap. And, and it's hard to keep that promise. And, but the way you get better, in our last few albums, was like we went back to songwriting school, so they don't look as experimental. But if you think about them, they are. It's just the experiment we were involved in was, was, was formal songwriting. Even the reason Edge and myself did Turn Off the Dark at Spider-Man was we were interested in Rodgers and Hammerstein, interested in Broadway, because we wanted to understand the songwriters. And we'd met Paul McCartney, and he was like, you know, when we used to do, we used to get better paying gigs if we could play, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein or the American Songbook. And, yeah, the Beatles, he said, we get paid this amount for like, you know, for the, like the rock and roll shows, you know, at a wedding, posh wedding. We play in a, one of those complicated songs. I'm going, that's where they learned all those chords. Edge, should we do? <laughs> so, that's, but the, so we, we're experimenting, that you're, you're growing to try and be the best that you can be. And yes, there are moments when you're not as, as, as focused and things can go wrong. And, um, you know, uh, we walked out on stage. Somebody here from Italy, I met them on the way in. I remember on the Innocence tour walking out and on stage and there was an Italian reviewer who said, in Bono, he walked out on stage uh, with his air color of chicken wing. <laughs> and, and I was trying to do the punk peroxide thing, but it hadn't quite come off. We make mistakes, Emma. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to remind you of the mullet you wore in Live Aid? No. <laughs> oh, very strangely, the peroxide blonde on your wedding day. Mm. Uh, nice. Yeah. Um, when it does go right, though, you write so well in the book mm. about this, about what you call the cathedral thing that happens to the band. You don't call it a thing. You have better words than that. But but the, the, the experience that an audience will arrive, say, at a 100,000 person stadium. You've paid 150,000. But, at, you know, at a massive stadium, these people arrive as individuals, as strangers. And they go through something with you, especially when the song can start singing you and you start being inside it. And the audience leave as a collective. They've all gone through this experience together. And it kind of is like the moment in a cathedral when you've sung together and you've listened together and you've cried together and you've been moved together. It's, it, and you're right, it, I've never read anyone else write about this. It is magical. Well, you know, there's some technical reasons for this. Like, I mean, U2 is, 
it's kind of a social experiment, really, um, that started in Mount Temple Comprehensive School. But it, it, it is, it's a bit like a Welshman, an Englishman, and two Irishmen walk into a comprehensive school. One of them, one of the Irishmen is even a Protestant. Um, it's, it should, doesn't make sense. But the Welshman, the edge, David mm -hmm. Evans. Mm -hmm. Not a very good Welsh accent. <laughs> he brings with him the weight of that choral tradition. You know, I mean, my missus would be, does not want me to say, and there's no one on the island of Ireland would allow me to say just how much I love to hear the whales singing at the rugby matches. But, and so I'm not going to say because I have to go home. But that feeling, you know, there's their fifths, there's technical reasons for it, but that depth of sound, Edge sort of is attracted to that. It's in him. And and Adam's like he's sort of posh, Sid Vicious. <laughs> he he's able to play the most sophisticated like jazz bass and then the real simple stuff, but in between doesn't do. And his whole life is four strings better than six. I just wanna be in U2 and I wanna be I wanna be out playing in U2. But he brings this, he's, if you listen to our band, he's the driver of it, more than the guitar. The reason why Edge can make that ethereal kind of whirling dervish thing is because Adam's driving it and, and Larry the same. So, but that thing of being, of, a, of the stadium shape-shifting into the cathedral is, I accept part of what U2 does is religious art. And I didn't know that, perhaps, until I started writing the book. And I realized that, oh wow, something was going on in Man Temple Comprehensive. That though it couldn't be pigeonholed in normal religious terms, because it was a non-denominational um, in Ireland in the 70s, I mean, the Civil War was a real possibility. The country was dividing on sectarian lines. And here's us, where, you know, in this school, this only school, where they have Protestants and Catholics, and even more extraordinary for the time, boys and girls. And um, so nobody's talking to us about religion. Certainly, I'm not getting it at home either because my father's Catholic and my mother's Protestant, so they don't want to talk about this. And you have this really sad thing where my father's dropping us off to St. Canis's and Fingless. My mother, my brother and I. And then he goes up, you know, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's half a mile less to St. Canis's and Fingless, but the Catholic one. And I suppose at a young age I saw how ridiculous that was. But somehow, I'm attracted to that, that feeling. And I was talking recently, probably in this room, about going into St. Paul's Cathedral at Advent. I'm like, I've always, I'm not into that kind of thing. Like I'm sort of, I no, I wasn't into that formal religion thing, but sneaking into the back of St. Paul's on Advent, they turn off the lights this medieval cathedral, and it's just this, and the Americans have ru ruined the word awesome, but it's <laughs> awe, you know, you feel, it, you're in the dark, the lights are off, and then this choir comes, this boys choir thing, and they're making this sound, and they're bringing lights, it's light enters the world, and something in me is ringing like a bell again, and I feel, and a lot of people in Ireland, for example, because of the Catholic Church and it, the, 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 the horrific crimes that were done, 
um, in the name of the Catholic Church, or in the north of Ireland, some of the Protestant churches filling people with hate. People can't even go to religion. It's just, it is. Uh, over here, you more had death by sticky bone um, Christianity. So it's this, the, the church of niceness. <laughs> but I will point out that if you go back to the abolitionists here, and you go back to, like, I've been reading about Wedgwood and that family, I can understand how Make Poverty History came out of this country. I can understand the value system. And it's a Judeo-Christian thing. You know, it's, it's, and I accept that the UK is much more interesting for its other faiths now arriving, you know, other Abrahamic traditions even, and Hindu. Um, but back to the Zen Presbyterian, that is the edge. Um, that explains the cathedral. Sorry about that, I went into one. I do The, the, the sections in the book about your political work um, are compelling and um, I thought I knew a lot of it. It turns out I didn't. I mean, the things that happened behind closed doors between you and American presidents rocked my brain. Just extraordinary. Tell me those. We don't have much time. We're all presidents. And, you know, there was a lot of chiefs of staff and okay. regular lawmakers. Just want to say yeah, that. Yeah, thanks. You're, you're humble. No, I'm just a strategic. I knew they were the decision makers. So I wanted to find out where they drank on a Friday night and I would be there. And then they would tell their boss, the senator, he's very good, this Irish fellow. It's a tactic. It didn't stop you screaming at President Bush one day, though, did it? We won't go to that now. Bono, the work that you did as an activist, you're still doing, and you have done so intensely and successfully for so many years. How does that impact on the band? How do your two worlds intertwine? It became very unhip work. Um, and it was harder for some of the band than others. Um, yeah, that was tricky. And they had the values, as I say, from the beginning, but they were you know, there were more rock and roll values. And Paul McGuinness, our manager at the time, would always say, you know, it's not the job of the artist, Bono, is to describe the problem. You do not necessarily have to solve it. <laughs> and I missed that memo. Uh, <laughs> so I would thought, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm a problem solver. The, I, the word, the pretentious word was actualist. I thought I'd made it up and then I discovered it in the dictionary. But, I wanted to be to actually be a part of actual changing things Practice. if I could. And that meant you know, Brian Murphy is here. I've been working with Brian Murphy for twenty five years. He's like a tour manager, but I wouldn't fuck with him if you jumped out of <laughs> he's run security companies and and Brian's a boxer. So he's a boxer um, and if you ask Brian about boxing, he'll tell you the, the real the strategy. You you have to know what the you have to know your opponent. You have to get to know everything about them, and you know where they'll crack. You know what their weakness. You know what the strengths are. And so I came in that strategy. I applied to my activism. I I just got to know these people. I would I would never ever meet in a million years coming from where I came from. And you know what? I learned stuff from them. I really did. And, and I was, you know, appalled sometimes by some of these people. Um, but more often than not, I found people who lost their idealism. If, 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 if they'd let me down, or if, they, if, if, if they were off, I, 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 I realized they lost their idealism along the way, but they probably started out for the right reasons. And I would always say to politicians, and this is, you won't, people don't say this, but I'm, I, I, I'm these, I've got a great life, do you know what I mean? I'm doing what I love, I'm over-regarded, over-rewarded. These people work really hard, most of them, for much less than I do. 
And, and if it's in the US, they spend half their time at home in their constituencies, uh, uh, half the time away from their families. And they're not all fuckers, you know? They're really not. And even some conservatives are really learnt. Um, <laughs> no, they're not. And, and, you know, I really, yeah, I really, I, I, I became really close friends with a lot of conservatives and I, and I, and they, in fact, they, George Bush launched the greatest health intervention to fight a single disease in the history of medicine. And I was part of that. And it was to fight AIDS, HIV AIDS, as a conservative. And he really meant it. And he, you know, it was hard, it was hard going to get through all the hoops. But that, that would give you faith, would it not? And, you know, I don't know, conservatism is going through its own crisis at the moment. Um, yes, who is it there who said there are weeks, you know, there are decades when nothing happens and there are, then there are, there are days when decades happen, or weeks when decades happen. Was that John or Vladimir Lenin? I don't know. But you seem to be having one in the UK. <laughs> How do you feel about where we are at the moment? I mean, you've got such strong feelings about us as a, as a country, us as a nation, and us as a globe. Just in a, in a nutshell, how do you think we are doing at the moment? I think the government has been overtaken by free market fundamentalists who don't understand the fundamentals of the free market. <laughs> We've had four members of you two in 40 years. You've had four chancellors in four months. And I want to say again that we need you. We really need the UK. You, we, you know, you led the world. And not just, you know, the Blair Brown years, but Cameron came in and there was a standing by people um, in, in, the de in, in the developed world, developing world, who were fighting for their dignity, fighting for education, fighting for health. And Great Britain was right there. Everybody knew it. And I do remember saying to um, whoever it was at the time, I think it was David Cameron, paint. Painted. Union Jack. Who knows what diff it is? I was having a piss in a in a in a ghetto in Kaiche in and and I just said it's a toilets provided by Diffid. I knew what Diffid was, the best development agency in the whole world. But nobody knew it was actually British taxpayers were paying for this. And it was fantastic. And now they've closed Diffid down, these, these other kinds of conservatives. And, um, and it's your country, you can do what you want with it, but we loved when you were leading. some of these questions in a moment because we have to or else we're going to get in trouble but I want you to tell a story first if you would be so bold which is my favourite page of the book of all the 560 pages in the book and it's, it's the bit where you're doing a Martin Luther King Day campaign and you're doing a concert and you feel very very strongly about Martin Luther King Day being a thing which obviously it now is this was way back, and so you've taken the band with you, and you're having a bit of a crisis of confidence about whether the band want to do the political work that you're so obsessed with. You know, they're with you, but you don't know if they actually want to put them. You're worried about it, and then you get a message saying that the concert is dangerous. Do you remember the bit I'm talking about? Um, there's a yeah, Martin Luther King Day was is a national holiday, but it was it was. 
it was not popular in certain states in the United States, and one of them was Arizona, and there was a governor called Meacham, and there was actually a cultural boycott, which we'd missed, and we ended up there to play our show, going, oh, how do we end up on the wrong side of this argument? So I might have overcompensated. And so next thing, there were some death threats. And, and again, I was being very Irish about the whole situation. We get death threats all the time. You know? <laughs> and, but some people around us took it very seriously, as they should have. And I remember playing our song, Pride in the Name of Love, which is dedicated to Martin Luther King. And the specific threat was, if Bono sings the verse about the assassination of King, he will, he will not make it to the end of the song. So I was like, total, yeah, big Irish. Big, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I got all messianic on myself. And I, I got to that, it's the third verse in the song. And the shot rings out in the Memphis sky and I, I kind of just got down on my hunkers like this when I sang it. It also looks good if you're going to get shot. You might as well look good. <laughs> 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 um, great on the t-shirts, but um, <laughs> so was, I, I, I then realised the, the gravity of the situation, and I did close my eyes, and I, I just. I just thought, just in case, I mean, I, I thought it was just a slim possibility. But I closed my eyes, and then I was prayerfully singing. A uh, shot rings out in the Memphis sky, free at last. They took your life, but they could not take your pride in the name of love. And I'm still alive, oh good. <laughs> and, and I looked up, and I couldn't see the crowd because Adam Clayton was standing in front of me and he'd been there for the entire <laughs> Yeah, that's who Adam Clayton is. For all his posh viciousness. But that's how much you are a family regardless of whether they wanted to be that. I'm going to go straight to these, don't even speak. <laughs> okay, we're going to do You're very this. long questions. <laughs> There's so many of them. I'm just going to do the short ones. They're going to be like yes, no questions. We're going to do them for three minutes and then it's the end of them. Okay? Happy? Okay. okay, so Dean Roseman says, sex or drugs or rock and roll? <laughs> Rock and roll is a very sexy drug. Um, this week, it's Miss Sarajevo, because I was thinking about my dad, and the bit with Luciano Pavarotti sings, I wrote the melody thinking of my father, Bob, singing in the bath in, in, in Tense Wood Road. So it was on my mind this week, so that's my favorite song this week. Yeah. Where is the most obscure place you've ever had a pint of Guinness? There is no corner of Africa that you cannot find a bottle of Guinness, if not a pint. And I do remember riding a lift somewhere in the United States and this very tall, elegant black man was in the lift with this short Irish man, me. And we were making small talk. And I, I said, out of town, or out of town, yeah. And then I said, the Guinness doesn't travel well, does it? As a joke. He said, no, not at all. <laughs> I said, where are you from? He said, Nigeria, where they make Guinness. <laughs> The biggest plant of Guinness outside of Dublin is happens to be in 
Nigeria. True. Um, outside of your music, what do you think is your greatest achievement? Without a shadow of a doubt, it is my wife and our four children. Not that that was always easy on them. Do you know, there's actually nothing hotter than a man who's been obsessed with his wife for 40 years. It's great. Yeah, it's not just me. Even oh, the kids are trying to get married. to know her. Uh, I would, by the way, say your greatest achievement at the moment is your daughter, Eve Houston, as one of the bad sisters. Oh, yes. Bad daughter. Come on. Yeah. Um, have you found what you're looking for? Of course not. Um, wait, hang on, wait, everyone trying to put them to end on. Um, are you ready to be Prime Minister next week? <laughs> we'll move to a smaller house. <laughs> And finally, this is a grown-up one. What time does the Edge put his hat on? <laughs> does he have his breakfast first? <laughs> the Edge has just... has just... <laughs> but we have some music coming out, and um, it's 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 a retrospective of stuff. I won't tell you too much about it. Um, it's called Songs of Surrender. Shh. <laughs> and uh, but I was saying to Edge, so would you be on the album cover, like, because I'm already on the book cover. And he said, yeah, if we could put this photograph on, and it's him with his head as shiny as a cue ball. Looks <laughs> fucking great. Thank you. Something else that looks that great is uh, your book. I am so happy that everybody in this room has already purchased a copy of Surrender because I'm going to have to do a very hard sell on it otherwise. Because it's you are just you're just gonna you're gonna read it when you get it in November, and you're then gonna look back on this last hour and think, oh, now I understand. It's profoundly brilliant, and I say that completely objectively. It's an extraordinary book. You're an extraordinary man. And this was an amazing experience. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome.